Well, with the new year coming in the next, in the course of the next couple weeks, you're going to be getting all kinds of fun tax documents in your mailboxes in preparation of the time that we all look forward to each and every year of getting to file our taxes. As annoying as that is, a couple years ago in the middle of the summer, I got a letter from the IRS. And I opened it and discovered that I would have the privilege of getting audited. Now, um, I just want to I just want to encourage you if if the IRS is watching our, our our services or if they're listening to our podcast, which you can find wherever you enjoy podcasts under Lakeside Algoma. If you ever if you ever miss a message, just go on there. You can download the podcast. You can stream it uh, when you work out, when you go on a long drive, if you're having trouble falling asleep at night, whatever the course may be for you. You just download it and you can listen uh, listen to that, or you can watch us along on our on our YouTube channel. We we put them all on our website as well, but also you can go to youtube.com slash Lakeside Algoma, and you can follow along with all of our series there. So in case our friends from the IRS are doing that, I just want to tell you, they're some of the kindest, most incredible people you'll ever meet. Like, I can't think of a better group of people that I've ever had the privilege of, of encountering. And so I got, I, got a, I got a letter, and immediately I started to freak out because I hadn't yet dealt with them and discovered just how wonderful they are. And so... I'm starting to freak out because the tax code is really complicated. It's really complicated. And it's really, really in-depth and it's really detailed. And I don't understand the first thing about the tax code. Now, luckily in my situation, it was as simple as a former employer had failed to submit some tax documents. And all I had to do was send a picture of that. And then it was great, and, and, everything, and everything was over. But I was freaking out as soon as I got that letter because of how complicated the tax code is. I'm not a CPA. I don't understand all this. I'm just, I, I just, I don't. I, I use TurboTax, and I go through, and I enter everything to the best of my ability and figure they have better things to do than come after people like me. Um, but but that's, that's just it. The tax code is something I don't understand. So as soon as I got that letter from, once again, my dear friends at the IRS, I just started to panic and freak out. You know, our faith can be that way. Our faith can be that way. Our faith can be really complicated and really complex. And if you're somebody who didn't grow up in church, you can hear all these words like you you pass by people and sometimes when people agree with something or, or they hear something they like, they shout out a strange word. You're like, what? Amen. What does that even mean? Or or if you go into a, if you go into a traditional church, they've got a room in there called the fellowship hall. And you're like, what? And that sounds that just sounds weird. What's, what's that all about? And, and then if you've ever met some people who love and follow Jesus, they do their best as well just to make things really complicated and really complex. And for somebody who's on the outside looking in or even somebody who's not, you just look at this and say, do I understand all this? What's, what's this all about? And so last week, we saw as we started looking at a book in the New Testament called 1 Corinthians, and it's called that because it was written to a church in, in a town called Corinth, and so that's where we get Corinthians, and the reason it's 1 Corinthians is because there's two letters that we have in, in the New Testament, and so this was the first letter that was written. It was written by a former pastor and a guy named Paul who God used to write two-thirds of the New Testament. And he wrote this letter to to the church. And what we saw last week as we started this is we saw this, that God uses simple, ordinary people to accomplish his work. And this morning we're going to continue that theme as we look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. So if you have your Bible apps or your phones or your tablets, you can follow along there. And if not, the verses will be on the screens as we continue our look at the book of 1 Corinthians where we read these words. And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. And so here's, what, here's the first thing that we see is that for those of us who follow Jesus, we just need to keep it simple. Just keep it simple. Just talk like you normally talk. Use terms that you normally use. Don't try to feel like you have to develop a new vocabulary as a result of the fact that you follow Jesus. Just keep it simple. That's, that's what the Apostle Paul is saying here. He's saying, I could have, if I wanted to, I could have used all the verbs, I could have used all the words that you didn't understand. If you've ever heard a philosopher give a lecture, you're just, at least I am, you know, I'm just like, huh? 
I need to pull out the dictionary or the source and figure out what in the world is this person even talking. You've, have you ever read anybody that way? You spend 10 minutes on a single page because you have to sit there and th- just really think about every phrase that you've read. And I know some people love that. They're like, oh, that's just such an intellectually enriching experience. And I'm just like, well, this is getting really boring really fast and wasting my time. Right? And so what Paul's saying to the people, to the people that he's writing to, he's like, just keep it simple. Don't make it more difficult than it has to be. I could have come and I could have talked in ways that you could barely understand, that you could barely fathom, but that's not the point. The point is this, to keep it simple. I could have come with lofty speech or wisdom, but I didn't. I came to you proclaiming the testimony of God. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. So this is my focus, he says. My focus of everything I did was Jesus. Jesus is the focus of everything that I did. And so I just want to encourage you, for those of you who are Christ followers, for those of you who made the decision to follow Jesus, let Jesus drive all that you do. Let Jesus drive all that you do. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. So as Christ followers, let's make sure that the central theme and the central focus of our lives is the same as this. That Jesus is what drives all that we do. That's what it's all about. That everything we do points to and focuses on Jesus. That when people look at us, what they see is the theme and the aim of our lives is for us to point other people to Jesus. This is what drives all that we do. And then he continues and he says this, And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling, and my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And here's something that's incredibly important. That your life, is just as important as your words. You can claim to follow Jesus. You can speak in a vocabulary that other people can, can barely fathom and can barely understand, that they scratch their heads and say, what in, the world are, what in the world is he talking about? What in the world is she talking about? What do they mean by that? You, you, can, you, can, you, can, you can just perfect that. You can have all the right answers. People can look at you and and just think how incredibly wise you are and how you've got it all together. But your life, your life is what matters. Your life is what has to measure up. Your life is the first thing that people are going to see, and they're going to forget all about your words. They're going to look at your life. Somebody told me once, and I'll never forget it, people are going to forget what you say, but they're never going to forget how you make them feel. People are going to forget what you say, but they're never going to forget how you make them feel. And here, the Apostle Paul is writing to the church of Corinth, and he says, make sure that as people who follow Jesus, that your life matches the words that you speak. It's not enough to have all the theological answers. It's not enough to be able to point everybody to every verse in the Bible and have it all together and and make it an intellectual exercise. Your life matches must measure up. When people look at you, what they need to see is they need to see the characteristics of Jesus flowing in you and through you. How you live your life is just as important, if not more so, than what you say. And this can be incredibly challenging and incredibly sobering. But it's incredibly true. That the lives that we lead are on display long after the words that we speak. And so as people who follow Jesus, this must be our aim. This must be our focus. That when people look at us, they see love. That they see Jesus in us and through us. And it's not merely an intellectual exercise in which we can say the right things, but rather that we lead our lives in the right way. And then he says this. 
Yet among the mature we do impart wisdom, although it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away, but we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. And so what Paul says here is he says, there is a wisdom that is not of this world that comes to those of us who follow Jesus. There's a wisdom that is not of this world that comes to those of us who follow Jesus, but just remember this, because it doesn't come from this world, you're going to be misunderstood. You're going to be misunderstood. Because in a world that desperately seeks love, to be somebody who is loving is great, but it's unnatural. And so there are going to be times that people look at you and they don't understand because it's unnatural. It's not the predominant theme of the world in which we live. And so as a result of it being countercultural, as a result of you being the exception, people aren't going to understand why it is that you do the things that you do. And it doesn't even mean, by the way, that they're going to be repelled by it. There could be elements of it that they're repelled by. But they're just not used to it and they're just not comfortable. And when you walk into a circumstance or a situation which you're not used to or you're not comfortable, it takes some time to get accustomed to it. It's an adjustment. If you've ever walked into a new place and not known anybody, if you've ever moved to a new location and had to start over, you understand. If you've ever been a student moving to a brand new school in the middle of a school year, if you've ever transferred colleges halfway through, when you come in and everybody else is already established in their friend groups and everybody else kind of has that language already and everybody else has already determined who they're going to live with in their dorms or in their off-campus apartments, and then you walk in as the new student, there's an adjustment phase. And it doesn't mean that the people at the college aren't welcoming or loving. It doesn't mean that the new students at the new school don't want anything to do with you because their cliques are already established. It doesn't mean when you move to a new town that nobody wants you there. It just means that you're new. And everybody else already has all this time and all these relationships already invested. It's the same way in our culture in which we live. There is a norm. People are accustomed to the norm. When somebody comes in and they bust up that norm, it's an adjustment phase. And as followers of Jesus, as we look at our culture right now, our hearts break because we see that we have so much to offer to a world so desperate in need, but understand that what we have to offer is unnatural. And so you will be misunderstood. And the problem with that, once again, comes from when you derive all of your self-worth from what other people say and think about you. And if that is where you find all of your significance, you're setting yourself up for failure as a follower of Jesus because essentially what you're being promised is this. As a follower of Jesus, there will be times in your life where you do the right thing, where you love people well, and you are misunderstood. And I can promise you that because Jesus promised us that and it happened to him. And so we have to confront some things personally. The first thing we have to confront is where do I find my value? Where do I find my significance? Is it what everybody else says about me? Is it what everybody else thinks about me? Is it the praise or the accolades that everybody else has heaped upon me? Is it the fact that this person really likes me? Because while those things feel good, they're ultimately empty. And the praise, sooner or later, if you stick around long enough, will become criticism. And the people that you love the most will disappoint you, and you will disappoint them. And if that is the source of your self-worth, you will be a roller coaster of emotions. And you're inviting instability into your life. Jesus offers us another way. He offers us something greater. He offers us to find our significance and our self-worth and who our creator, God, has said we are and what he thinks about us. And God thinks you're so incredible that while you rebelled against him, he sacrificed himself so that you could have a relationship with him. 
and his son Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross. Where God looks at you, he doesn't see all of your mistakes. He doesn't see all of your regrets. He sees somebody of intrinsic value and intrinsic worth, so much so that he would come to redeem you, and he desperately desires a relationship with you. And oh, by the way, God sees all your faults, and he sees that you don't measure up, and he loves you anyway. The question is, what are you going to allow to guide you? Where are you going to find your self-worth? Where are you going to find your intrinsic value? And if it's in what everybody else says and thinks about you, just know this, as a follower of Jesus, you're going to be sorely disappointed because you're going to be misunderstood. Here's what, I'm, I'm just going to read this again because I know this is kind of complex, and, and as we just continue to break it down, here's, here's the next point, but... I'll get to that after I read again. Yet among the mature, we do impart wisdom, although it is not a wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away, but we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Everyone has an idea of what God is like and who God is. Everybody has an idea of that. But here's the reality. If they had really understood who God is and what God was like, Jesus wouldn't have been crucified. Everybody has an idea of who God is and what God's like, but if there was an accurate interpretation of who God is and what drives the heartbeat of God and what God's like, then he just says, Jesus wouldn't have been crucified. They wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory if they really understood the heartbeat of God. And then we get into a really difficult part where he writes this. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the Spirit of that person, which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God, And we impart this in the words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. All right, let's break that down. (laughs) We, we're just going to be real honest right now. We all know people who do their best to make us look crazy. We all know the people that were like, I just really wish you'd stop telling people you love Jesus. I I just really wish you would, because you're making us all look crazy. So if you could just stop and maybe keep it to yourself, that would be great. I I feel that. I'm just being honest with you. I feel that way. There are people that, and I'm just like, oh, that's going to be a news story, or that's going to be a tweet, or oh, just just please stop. Just, it's kind of like... When you're hanging out with your grandparents after the filter's gone, and also their hearing's gone, and they don't realize it, and so every thought's just coming out, but the person that they're trash-talking standing right in front of you at line, and they're hearing every word, and you're like, okay, Nana, thanks. <laughs> like That's how it is for some people. I just look at them, and I'm like, we get it. You love Jesus. You crazy. Please shut up and go home. Thank you. Thank you. But here's the deal. The people who don't know Jesus, they love to look at those people and be like, yep, that's what it, and these are the people who love Jesus. And they make us all look like freaks. They make us all look like we're crazy. Here's the deal. There are crazy Packer fans. There are crazy Packer fans, right? There are, <laughs> there just are. There are people that the rest of you are like, we're not all like that, I promise. I promise, we're not all, we're not all like, and some of you are like, I don't know what you're talking about, Brian, because you're the crazy Packer fan, (laughs) that everybody else is like, we're not all like that, we're not, we're not all like that, this is true in every walk of life, you have some coworkers that you're just like, "Mm, maybe don't tell anybody where you work, thanks, (laughs) that, that would be better. You've got some customers like that. You're like, please don't recommend my establishment or my businesses to anybody. Thanks. I'd prefer they not hear it from you as opposed to hear it from you. So 
there are crazy Christians, and there are people that do their best to make us all look like we're crazy, but we don't have the market cornered on this. We, we aren't alone in that. So just keep that in mind. But understand that there's this whole idea here that is incredibly difficult to talk about, that this, the Spirit of God is alive, and it's at work, and it calls people to do things, and it, nobody fully comprehends the Spirit of God. And so sometimes we just have to look at the crazy people, and we have to be like, well, maybe, maybe. But no, we're not alone. We're not alone in that. And here's the overall bigger point, that the Spirit of God and the wisdom of God is not what everybody was expecting. The Spirit of God and the wisdom of God is not what everybody was expecting. And what we're talking about today is encountering the Spirit of God. It's not about the pursuit of religion. What we're talking about is having a genuine encounter with God so that God literally comes and resides within those of us who follow Jesus so that he convicts our hearts when we make choices that we shouldn't make. He, he steers our directions and he guides our paths and he helps us. And I know because of, because of people that we're all like, oh, they're just crazy and I wish they would just stop talking. This, this idea can be really foreign and it can be really difficult to understand. But as a follower of Jesus, you know exactly what I'm talking about because you've heard the the voice in your heart. And I'm not saying it's an audible voice. You don't have to get freaked out on me. But you just know that the direction of the course, you can feel it within you that when you're about to make a decision, sometimes you're directed one direction. Sometimes you're prodded in a direction. When you make a mistake, something that you regret, you know because you can feel it within you. And that is God on display at work within you. Let's not make this more complicated and more difficult than it has to be. What we're talking about is encountering that within us, the work of God alive within us. And we're not talking about the pursuit of religion. The pursuit of religion is empty. Because religion will sit there and it will applaud you for everything that you can do in, uh, on yourself. And it will applaud you for all the things that you know. And it will beat you up for every mistake that you made. And relationship with God will be there for when you make those mistakes to pick you up and restore you. And to bring about humility within you. It doesn't exalt you for what you know, but rather it keeps pointing you to Jesus. And so that's why I just want to encourage you, this is not about religion. The pursuit of religion leaves you empty. This is all about having a relationship with Jesus that changes you at your core, that helps you know that there is a God who created you and who loves you and wants to guide you so that you make wise choices in your life and you bring about God's glory through your conduct and what you do. Relationship helps us know the thoughts of God and the truth about God. Never, never sacrifice a genuine relationship with God in the pursuit of religion. Then he closes out the chapter with these words. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. And he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. What's the point of all this? The point of all this is very simply this. God at work within us. It helps us make sound decisions. It helps us make the right choices. This is not an intellectual exercise. It's not about knowing all the right words to say. It's not about memorizing all the right doctrines or creeds or, or thoughts. It's not about that. What it is about is having a genuine relationship with Jesus. And when we have that genuine relationship, we are once again connected to our creator. And at that point, we are helped in our lives to make right decisions and live lives that honor and glorify God. That we are to be spiritual people. And once again, how do we arrive at that? We arrive at that through a relationship with Jesus, not a pursuit of religion, and that we live according to the spirit at work within our lives. And so what do we do with all this? What, is, what does all of this mean? Well, first, 
It means this, and we go back to how, how Paul started this chapter. We tell our stories. We tell our stories. We use simple words in the way we live our lives. But we tell our stories of what God has done in our lives. How we've been rescued. How our lives have been transformed as a result of our relationship with Jesus. How our lives have been blessed. How in the midst of despair, we didn't have to walk through things alone. How God was there. And we tell those stories to people. Not in, not in ways that freak them out. Not in ways that they're just like, huh? Not in ways that, that we use all these words and all this language that they don't understand. But in normal, everyday words, with normal language, we tell people what God has done in our lives. And just as importantly, if not more so, we model it in the way that we live. We model it in the way that we live. So that when people look at our lives, they see love, they see all the, all the things of God at work and on display within us. And here's the deal. You're not going to always get it right. You're just not. You're not perfect, and there are a lot of jerks in the world, okay? So when you, when you marry those two themes of your imperfection and a lot of jerks, there's going to be times that you just, you just fall short. It doesn't mean you give up. It doesn't mean you lose heart. It doesn't mean you throw in the towel. You vow to do better. You ask for forgiveness, and you keep going. And maybe... Maybe this was at one point a really big part of your life, but you just stopped because somewhere along the way you blew it. And probably in a way that a lot of people saw. And so now you're that guy or now you're that lady that everybody knows. Oh, this isn't their background. Or, oh, did you hear about this? And if your pursuit is religion, that follows you. And that holds you back. And that descriptor becomes your identity. And the saddest part of all is you start to believe it. You start to believe you're your struggle. You start to believe you're your mistake. You start to believe that you're your regret. Relationship with Jesus sees your value. It sees your worth. It sees your potential. It sees the you that nobody else sees and nobody else talks about. And it says that you have so much value that God would love you so much that he would pay the price for that mistake, for that regret, for that disappointment. And oh, by the way, you no longer have to be defined by that. Through Jesus, you're made new. This is our story. This is what drives us. This is why we exist at Lakeside. It's not about the pursuit of religion that people have to feel like they have to do A, B, C, and D and ever be good enough because the message of Jesus in the cross is simply this. You're not good enough and you don't measure up because the standard of God is perfection. But in our imperfection, God came in his perfection and died upon the cross for our sins. Three days later, rose again and proved that he was victorious over sin, hell, death, and the grave. And we could be made free. And it's a simple process of giving as much to ourselves, as giving as much of ourselves as we understand over to him. And saying, Jesus, take my life. I understand that you died for me. I understand that you rose again. Take my life and make me yours. I want to follow you. And it's that humble, simple prayer that changes everything. We need to live that with our lives, and we need to speak it with our words in simple ways. Because that's what drives us here. We're starting an initiative that we announced last week with with some of the ministry leaders here at the church. And and our initiative is this. This year, it is our goal at Lakeside to give away 100 new welcome gifts to people. It's not about building up Lakeside. 
but it's about us leveraging our stories and leveraging our lives and inviting people to join us, not on this pursuit of religion, but on this pursuit of relationship and seeing more people experience the love, hope, forgiveness, and freedom of Jesus. And that is what we're all about, and that is what must drive us. And so we're asking you to use your life and your story and your network and invite other people in so that they could experience the love of Jesus. And lastly, we're asking you to live according to the Spirit of God as followers of Jesus. So how do we do that? How do we let our lives become more like Jesus? Well, this is, this is some of the ways. First is you engage Scripture. Scripture is God's heartbeat revealed to us. And so download the Bible app. It's totally free. And if you're nowhere, then turn on notifications and start with a verse a day. Just start with a verse a day. And just read it and think about it for a couple minutes. And just see how that changes your life. And I promise you this, it will. And as it does, just say, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to devote a little bit more time. And so maybe you've been doing the verse of the day. And now it's time to go a little bit further. So maybe it's a paragraph or, or a chapter even based on, based on where you are. And, and just really taking some time to engage with it and think it through and just go from there. And if, if you've been there, then it's, it's time to go even deeper. And maybe you go a, a, a chapter or, or a couple, whatever the case may be for you. But the point is, get engaged with Scripture. It's not going to look for everybody all the same. But if you're nowhere, start with a verse. If you've been doing the verse for a while, get to a paragraph. If you've been doing that for a while, get to a chapter. If you've been doing that for a while, go to a couple chapters. And just really process what God's communicating through his word. Spend time praying. And I know that this can be a really foreign concept to people. But again, just in a simple language, talk to your creator. You don't have to do it out loud. You don't have to make your lips move. I mean, some people like to do that in the cars. And other people look you know, a bit crazy. But we've already talked about it, right? We don't have the market cornered on crazy. So that's all right if that's the way that works best for you. Other people, it's just within them. Some people, you know, whatever the case may be. But, but pray. Here's the deal. Make your life all about this, that your pursuit is more Jesus and less you. That each day, there's a little bit more Jesus that takes over and a little bit less you. And put that on display. In a minute, we're going to celebrate the fact that we have a God who loves us. And he paid the price for our mistakes and our sin by dying on a cross. Because the cost of our regrets and the cost of our sin, the cost of, of all that is death. And so that's, that's a physical death that we'll all experience, but that's a spiritual death apart from God. But Jesus came so that we could be redeemed and we could be restored. And we could be made new. The cost, of our, the cost of our mistakes, the cost of our sin is death, but the gift of God is life that never ends. And that's available through the sacrifice of Jesus. And so what we're about to do, if you're new to church, it, it might not make sense to you, and if you're not a follower of Jesus, just let it pass you by, because it's going to be the worst appetizer you've ever had in your life, all right? But we're going to pass out a cracker and some juice, and if you're a follower of Jesus, we invite you to join us in this, but this is just symbolic of the sacrifice that Jesus made when he died on the cross, when his body was broken and his blood poured out so that we could be restored. God, thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your forgiveness. Give us the power to tell our stories in just simple ways and in the way we live our lives. Make sure our lives, God, become more in tune with your will for us, that each day people will look at us and see less of us and more of you. We ask in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen.